What is a glass cannon? Maybe you don't play enough video games. Let me explain, because I definitely do. <laughs> In gaming terminology, the glass cannon is the character that can output a massive amount of damage, but is extremely fragile and as easily as they can destroy enemies, if they're not careful, they can be defeated just as soon. I thought we could get a- oh! <laughs> Every time, dude! Well, this gaming archetype translates to MMA pretty damn well. And these kind of fighters are some of the most fun to watch in the sport because you never know what's going to happen. I'm Bailey from MMA On Point. Before we get started, as always, thank you to our Hall of Famers. You are amazing and you appreciate us and we appreciate you. And these are MMA's 10 biggest glass cannons. Number 10, Houston Alexander. Don't be fooled by the name, okay? Houston Alexander is actually from Illinois. It's a facade, but his physique definitely wasn't. This guy had muscles on top of his other muscles, looking like the Hulk of MMA, and he hit about as hard as him. Don't make me angry. Ah! You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. It's obviously emotional for you. He did smash five of his first six opponents. Even his first two UFC fights were crackers. It took him less than a minute to eliminate Keith Jardine and then Alessio Sakara. Two devastating knockouts. But what happened next? He got knocked out twice himself in back-to-back -back fights. And then it was back to the regional scene. Oh, Houston oh, Alexander oh, now! Oh, He's going to work! He's dropped! So could you! The guy had the power, but he was undoubtedly pretty reckless with it. Now, he kept knocking out a bunch of guys, but it seemed like for every KO that he got... Oh, a big shot from Houston. Big left hand from Alexander. Alexander. He's down. He was on the end of another devastating loss. By the end of his 17 and 16 career, I think we'd seen the best and the worst of Alexander. But when it came to bare knuckle, no one's been able to find his off button yet. Guy's undefeated. Number nine, Greg Hardy. There's not really any way to look at the Prince of War's MMA career other than to say he was rushed to where he was because of what he did in the NFL. Including his first three amateur fights though, he finished everyone in about one minute because he did have a ridiculous amount of power and he was fighting guys that were just willing to exchange with him and he only needed to land one good punch and the fight would be over. And apart from an illegal knee in his UFC debut, he kind of got those same opponents in the UFC that were willing to fight him toe to toe and, you know, he knocked them out as well. But against the actual elite heavyweight competition, I mean, we got to see there was a massive disparity between his offensive and defensive capabilities. Sometimes he would even still land that big shot, but now he's fighting the kind of guys that weren't just going to go down after one punch, and then he had to rely on his actual MMA skill set and his chin, and it just didn't end well for him. I think that's the shit, man. Yeah, he could get knockouts, but could he actually fight? Well, his career says otherwise. It is in right now. Number eight, Pat Barry. Well, look out, here comes the human cinder block, Pat Barry, who transitioned from kickboxing into MMA, and at least to begin with, he had a massive advantage over most of the people he was fighting. In 2008, he debuted, fought in May, June, and August, and by December, Kick so hard. He was already in the UFC, and three of those first fights ended by leg kick. He was more consistent than Postman Pat, and probably had more power than Vegeta. But like all bosses, he had a weakness, and that very quickly became apparent. He was kind of undersized, but it was also his belief that he could simply knock anyone out with little to no resistance. His UFC career played out with five wins and seven losses, where he was finished in every single one of them. Most of the time, he was able to land a big shot on his opponent, only to then be put to sleep or submitted just moments later. I know you hit hard, Pat, but so does everybody else. And being able to crack at heavyweight just sometimes isn't enough. You have to be able to take a punch as well. Number seven, Todd Duffy. In any good action film, there's always that one dude that looks like he's walked straight out of a cryo tank, engineered to hit harder, move faster, and just crush everyone with his massive torso. If the UFC had a version of that, it would have been Todd Duffy. Never in my life have I seen a man who looks so much like the perfect heavyweight athlete. His five wins before the UFC were bloody ridiculous. Two of them were over in 15 seconds, and then he eliminated his first UFC opponent in seven seconds. Oh my God, who is this man? Where did he come from? He's about to be the best heavyweight of all time. Except it turns out Todd couldn't actually take a punch very well. Like, at all. What? You fuck! After scoring Mike Russo for three rounds, he got tagged with one big shot and the fight was over. And if he thought that was bad, he then went to Dream to become the first heavyweight champion and over him KO'd him in just 20 seconds. 
I mean, he still KO'd three dudes in the first round after that, but then a freaking out of shape Frank Mir KO'd him and the book was out on Todd. He certainly looked like the Terminator and he had devastating power, but his off switch was apparently very easy to find. Pretty much unlike the Terminator, actually, really. Number six, Jimmy Manoa. Outside of the UFC and the growing regional promotions of the UK, Jimmy was very much the poster boy for the old UC MMA promotion back in the day. You might remember them. They tried to do that rugby MMA crossover. That was fun. As Bosman comes forward around the side, charges head first and deposits his man in the net as well. Well, Manoa started fighting for them and he was just absolutely flatlining guys. Just unloading devastating punches. Like more KO power than anyone in the rest of England. He became their light heavyweight champion and defended about five times with each defense basically ending in a devastating knockout. And that southpaw stance. Oh. oh, and there's that left hook. That is such a devastating nightmare of a shot. At 11-0, he got an invite into the UFC where the finishes continued until he went to war with an Alexander Gustafsson who was fresh off a fight with John Jones and he was put out for the first time in his career. Over the next five years, Jimmy stayed in the UFC, where he managed to again knock out some of the best light heavyweights in the promotion, showing he was still clearly a dangerous guy. But he also got put out cold four times, some of them almost immediately against Volkan Uzdemir and Alexander Rakic in just 42 seconds. Big three, four hard, right? <laughs> it's almost like Jimmy beat everyone so easily coming up, he just didn't have a chance to work on the rest of his game. Number five, Sokaju. African athletes have certainly come a long way in MMA in recent years, but one of the continent's earliest stars is someone whose name goes relatively unmentioned by everyone but the hardcore fans. Sokaju. He became famous super early in his career when he made his Pride debut at just 2-1 and one, and as a 16-1 and one underdog against Little Nog. And he became the first guy to finish him, ever, and it only took 23 seconds. Then he followed that up with another KO against Ricardo Arona, and holy shit, he looked like the kind of guy that could be any of the best fighters in the world and do it violently. But guess what? Yes, he had two sticks of dynamite for fists and could pound the ground like a jackhammer, but he totally lacked the experience of some of the other world-class guys who now actually had to go and fight. He started getting finished as many times as he was knocking people out, and his final record, which is pretty much 50-50 at 19 and 18, is pretty much a perfect representation of exactly that. He's basically out on his feet. But Joe pours another left hand. You definitely didn't want to be anywhere near or underneath Sokaju, but compared to where he started and how his career actually went, it kind of showed that offense can only get you so far. Oh, nice hey, shot, good cut. Oh, and then oh, shot. it's over. Number four, Melvin Manhoof. Not many people in MMA have attacked people with the ferocity and potency of Melvin Manhoof. He was a guy with one punch knockout power, but he didn't just throw one punch, did he? He threw like 20, so uh, good luck with that. His record is also kind of ridiculous. 32 wins, 28 of them were first round finishes, and that's just in MMA. But the thing with opening up with that much offense is you're way more likely to get caught with something coming back at you. And unfortunately for Melvin, he wasn't always the best at taking a shot in return. Sometimes he got tired. Yeah, that's been established in our abysmal gas tanks list. And I don't know if it's because he was throwing himself forward into every strike, but Melvin has been knocked out cold in MMA at least six times. Which is quite a lot when you think about it, especially when you add eight more from his kickboxing career as well. But the best way to describe the glass cannonness of Melvin Manhoof is when he KO'd Mark Hunt, the heavyweight, in just 18 seconds. Hi. <laughs> And then just a few fights later, got KO'd himself in one punch by Robbie Lawler. Ah, you just never knew what was going to happen when they rang the bell with Melvin, apart from, well, violence, basically. Number three, Alistair Overeem. I don't know if you've seen Demolition Man, but it's one of the coolest films of all time. Stallone and Snipes running around the future together, blowing stuff up. What's not to love? In MMA, we had our own demolition man, Alistair Overeem, and he wasn't demolishing buildings, but people. He built himself a nice 12-fight win streak between 2000 and 2003, where he stopped all 12 opponents, but once he started fighting the elite of pride, we saw some holes in his defenses and that he could also be, yeah, knocked out. Alistair had all the weapons you want from a devastating striker. Great punches, kicks, especially his knees, but when guys actually went after him, like Sergei Karatonov did in Heroes, he often got finished. <laughs> 
Still, after that loss, he evolved into Uberim and he finished his next 10 of 11 opponents. On the outside, Alistair controlling Cedric. Oh. That's it! Good night, Irene! Showing once again, he had as much offensive output as a pissed off Kratos. But across his UFC career, he still found himself getting finished by half the roster. Even guys he was beaten because he just couldn't take damage. He even had to completely change his style to be more evasive because one shot could cause him to lose the fight. It's just a great example of a guy who had enough weapons to stop anyone, just as long as he hit you first. Number two, Brock Lesnar. Take a steam train, put a face on it, what have you got? I'm a white boy. Not Thomas the Tank Engine, but Brock Lesnar. Actually, if we're doing kids TV shows, he could easily have been a street shark. I mean, he was about as wide as he was tall and pretty much as scary. He's the leader of the street sharks. He's a great warrior. His special power is the right hand roundhouse punch. He sends a competition to a watery grave. Boom! Death. As accomplished as Brock was as a wrestler, he didn't exactly have the best MMA skill set, so he only had one option, full on attack, which was great. I mean, it worked most of the time. He finished two former UFC champions. But one thing Brock just never had the chance to learn was defense, like even basic striking defense. Going through the amateur scene and years of training will teach you how to take a punch and not to shut up. But we saw against guys like Kane and Overeem, Brock hadn't really had the time to learn that stuff, and he pretty much melted like a slice of warm brie. Even his win against Carl, Owen probably could have been stopped earlier. It wasn't exactly intelligent defense, you know what I mean? It was all out attack or that was it basically, he was going down. Number one, Cody Garbrandt. Exactly when the bantamweight division needed it, along came a guy who had the speed, the power and the tattoos, of course, to inject some new oomph into the division. I'll do something about it. We'll do something then. In just the two years it took Cody to get to the UFC, he knocked out five people. None of them made it past the second round. Might have been because he was 32-0 as an amateur boxer. Guys, in my research on... Oh! 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 But the thing about Cody is he was all offense, which obviously helped when he started his UFC run. I mean, he knocked out three guys in the first round before getting his title shot. One of those dudes was Thomas Almeida, who almost made it onto this list, to be honest, but he was a total offensive machine, but he's not exactly easy to put away. I mean, ask Sean O'Malley. Sucks to be him, huh? I mean, we saw the best of Cody Garbrandt against Dominic Cruz, evasive, elusive, an absolute machine. But that's not always the version we got. Later in his career, he showed he was great as the hammer, but when the shots started coming back the other way, he just couldn't seem to take him. No, you can do all the conditioning in the world with your new coach, you can't condition that fucking chin of yours. Unfortunately for Cody though, it wasn't TJ's chin that was the problem. It seemed to be his own, right? I mean, someone dumped all their stat points into damage when making Cody Garbrandt and just didn't increase his hit points at all. He suffered three consecutive knockout losses in a row where he was just caught swinging for the fences. And honestly, it's been up and down since then. But if anything, he's much more aware that it is a problem for him and he's been fighting more defensively ever since because, well, I just don't think he has a choice. All right, that's it. A list based on a video game analogy. I want to shout out this man. Yeah. Luke, great job editing the video, mate. Well done. Anything you want to say? Yeah, fuck off. Something I definitely learned while doing this list, I'll tell you. Everybody loves a glass cannon. I didn't realize how many of my favorite fighters were on this list because you love fighters who recklessly just swing for the fences and knock people out. And if they get knocked out themselves, at least it was still a good fight. So I'm sure some of your favorite fighters are on this list as well. Could you stop shut laughing in the background? Bloody maniacs. Also, I had to watch a lot of brutal knockouts whilst researching this one and I regret nothing. You might have noticed we've been putting out a lot of new videos, a lot of new content on the channel, really been able to mix things up. And that's, you know, a big part of that is because some of you guys have been supporting, you know, with the uh, the join button down below. So if you want to see more of that kind of stuff, you can hit that button, help support us on our creative endeavors to make MMA YouTube a better and more fun place, okay? Fun. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that one. Um, yeah, you can always give us a like to show some appreciation or hit subscribe if you haven't subscribed because you might be new here, in which case, welcome. And if you haven't subscribed yet, I just, what are you doing? Just press subscribe.